are we doing? It's a little warmer this week. Praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> hey, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can go ahead and open them to Proverbs chapter 13. Or if you don't have a Bible, you can Google search it. Just use Siri, say Google search Proverbs 13 or whatever, right? We're going to look at one verse here today. If we haven't met yet, my name is Doug. Uh, I give leadership to our young adult ministry here. And so glad you've chosen to join with us here on Table Tuesdays. Uh, we are in an awesome uh, six weeks uh, series of talks on this idea of friendship. Uh, and before I get into kind of the background and all that, let me just remind you by way of just a little, um, I don't know, a little preview. In March, we are going to kick off a really unique series called I've Always Wondered. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to be able to answer helpfully uh, the questions that you guys have that you just wondered about. And so I want to make sure that you uh, follow us on Instagram at the table Orlando, or you, uh, you know, go back to our connection lounge afterwards and make sure you register, get on our email list or some form of communication, because here's the deal. We're going to put out a survey and we're going to want you guys to just answer or uh, offer questions on the survey about what you're curious about. And over the four weeks, five weeks in March or so, we're going to answer the best questions that everybody asks. So you can not only answer it, but you can kind of see the like review process because people can like it. And, you know, there's a whole ranking system. It's going to be super awesome. So uh, be sure and do that. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait to get to March. But before we get to March, I got to be in February, which is coming up, and I got to be in this series here. So let me unpack this series. Hey, if you weren't with us last week, or maybe you're kind of it's the first time in a while, we're in a series called Friends Plus. What does that mean? Well, the big idea behind this series of talks is uh, that when you're pursuing relationships, we think it's a really good idea to pursue friendship. First, you should be putting everybody you know into the friend zone, okay? Everybody you can. You should enlarge your friend zone because uh, out of friendship, out of a relationship of friendship, all the other options are open. If you want to start a business with somebody, start a business with a friend. Because if business doesn't work out or if you sell, guess what? You can always go back to being friends. Uh, you want to uh, plant a church or start a movement with somebody, man, do that with a friend. Because once the church plant gets going and you move on or you do something else, guess what? You can always go back to being friends. If you want to date somebody, you should date a friend. You really should. Why? Because if you start dating them and dating doesn't work out, guess what? You can always go back to being friends. But most of us, as we approach relationships, we do it the other way, Right? We say, hey, I'm going to pursue business and networking with this person. And then if it doesn't work out or if it does work out, we'll try to add friendship on. And if the business doesn't work out, actually, we didn't, we didn't become friends and now we hate each other, right? Uh, or I'm going to go start this ministry with this person I just met. Seems like a nice fellow, right? And you start this church or this ministry or whatever, and then it doesn't work out for whatever reason. And now you hate each other. Or the one we all pursue, the one I pursued, the friends with benefits category, we are going to swipe and hook up and make out and do whatever. And maybe we can leverage it towards friendship later. And it doesn't work out anymore. And the romance goes away and there's no benefits. And now you're like, you know, she has the whole conversation. I just want to be friends. And you're like, friends? Are you kidding me? <laughs> we were never friends. How are we going to be friends? Every time I see you, I'm going to be like, dang, I used to make out with her. And now, I don't know, man. Right? We've all been there, right? It just doesn't work that way. And so... In this series of six talks, we're just saying this. Hey, what would it look like if you pursued friendship first and built everything else uh, off of that base? Last week, what we looked at is uh, this verse in Proverbs 17 that says this. Here's what the definition of a friend is according to Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, king of Israel. No big deal. Uh, he said this. A friend is someone who loves at all times. That, that love is a consistent type of love. They love you all the time, and in every way, we can get through anything. And that consistency breeds momentum. And that love consistency breeds this momentum, this relational momentum called friendship. And so a, a, a friend is someone who loves you at all times. Well, this week, now that we have that definition of what friendship is that we should be pursuing, we're going to look at friends plus and minus. How do I add more friends to my life? And maybe more importantly, how do I subtract the foolish people from my life? Now that I know what a friend is, how do I get rid of all those toxic people that just seem to be like moons surrounding the planet of my life, right? Is there some kind of like giant Star Wars type thing where I can just destroy this moon to kind of get it away from me? Like, how do we go about doing that? Uh, and to set all this up, I want to tell you a story about uh, when I was in high school. Uh, as you may not know me, I, maybe you do know me. My story is I, I grew up an atheist. I didn't know Jesus from anybody. I didn't know anything about the Bible. And then 
um, because of this friendship I had with a guy named Brad Rosman. In fact, he's going to be on your screen here. That's me. That's 23-year-old Doug. Uh, <laughs> hey, easy now. Come on. I have feelings. There's no shaming. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, it's my best friend Brad. Uh, just uh, as a fifth grader, uh, that's actually at Brad's wedding, just in case you're curious. Shout out to Brad and Lindsay, 15 years married. Uh, and I was the best man in his wedding. He was the best man in my wedding. Like, that's my boy for life, bad boys for life. Uh, I met him when I was a fifth grader, and he started inviting me to come to church. And I was like, no, there's no way I'm going to go to church. And he kept asking, kept asking, kept asking, kept asking, kept asking. And then finally, my freshman year, I was like, I'll go to church with you. And then my sophomore year of high school, I got saved. And Jesus came into my life and radically transformed my life. And Brad was there for it the whole time, just helping me understand Jesus and the gospel and the Bible. Just such a good friend to me. And let me tell you, I was a very inconsistent friend to him. <laughs> uh, I was a very, again, I, I came from a real kind of, I came from a wild background, let's just say this, uh, but Brad was really a good friend. And I just want to brag on him. If I, can I brag on my friend Brad right now? Shout out Brad Rosman. So Brad moved to, after, you know, when we were in high school, we had a public access TV show, like we just did. We ran the school news and uh, we just did a lot of crazy stuff. Anyway, he really liked film. And so he went to the University of Southern California to film school. And now he works for Disney where he's an editor. And there's a show, if you get Disney Plus, anybody on Disney Plus here? Yes, yes, uh, Bob Iger thanks you. Uh, so uh, on Disney Plus, there's a show called Tangled, the series, okay? So look at the screen here. If you get to the very end, Brad Rosman, that's his show. That's my boy, Brad Rosman. Shout out, Brad, if you're watching this later on streaming or YouTube, I got you, dog. You're my boy, bad boys for life. Um, so uh, let me tell you about one particularly crazy experience with me and Brad. Uh, and in fact, this story is so crazy that I was like, I totally made this up. So I texted him yesterday. I said, did I make up this story? And he was like, no, here are all the details. I was like, yes, that is exactly what I remember. So uh, Brad got this, it was our senior year of high school. Brad got this brand new Jeep Wrangler, uh, uh, forest green, uh, like the, the leather brown top, right? That was, And then like the giant wheels with the kind of spoilers and it just... I mean, it was just impeccably beautiful. And one of the first months that he had it, we were driving around town. It was in August, maybe September, in Texas. I'm from Texas. It's like triple digits, 110 degrees. But, you know, we top down. We're just like, oh, yeah, man. I think we're listening to like Master P uh, or something, like rolling around yelling No Limit Soldier out. If you know that reference, some of you are Googling that right now. Please be careful. The safe search should be on when you Google search Master P. Uh, a rapper from New Orleans, man, we're just listening to the music. And then so on the side of the road, we see this, this guy, I'm going to protect his name. We're going to call him George. So we see this guy, George, walking in like jeans and a long sleeve shirt. And we're like, oh my gosh, George, like, why are you out here? It's hot. Uh, and so we pull up next to him. He's one of our friends from school. And we're like, George, like, what's going on, man? You okay? He's like, man, I missed the bus. I'm trying to get home. And so, you know, Brad looks at me and I'm like, hey, let's, let's give him a ride home. Brad's like, okay, okay. So George gets in the Jeep, and we're driving, and we go. And George lived on maybe the, the, we might call it the bad part of town, the rough part of town. And so we're driving, like, you know, this is before GPS, so we couldn't be like, Waze, what's the direction of this address? And it's like, we're rerouting you to another city. You should not go there. Like, it wasn't one of those things. We didn't have that yet. So we're just like, okay. He's like, turn left, turn right, turn left. And we pull up in his neighborhood. And it's, you know that point when you're in a bad neighborhood and you get the heebie-jeebies? You're like, ooh. Like, this is maybe not the safest neighborhood here. So we see this one house, and there's all these dudes at the house. It's a two-story house. Um, it's an older, kind of falling apart house. And there's all these dudes outside barbecuing. And we're like, all right, that's weird. And George goes, that's my house. And we're like, okay. So we pull up. And I'm like, Brad, you stay here. Keep the car running. I'm going to... We get out. We're going to take old George inside, just make sure he's okay and situated. So we get out. We're walking in. And like, as I'm walking, remember, this is a new Jeep. All these guys who are in there barbecuing. And it's, it's really odd where they're standing. They're just kind of standing in the yard. This isn't an organized barbecue. It's like someone's just cooking for them. But the best way I could describe it, it was like a waiting room outside. Okay, you guys know where I'm going with this. So as we're walking in, those dudes see us. Um, I'm going to try to put this as delicately as we can. Um, two of us were not like everybody else in terms of just the culture thing going on here. So Brad and I stood out a little bit in this particular moment. George was, right. So we're walking in. All the dudes start passing me, going, and they're, they're like now surrounding Brad's car. They're looking underneath, and they're like kicking the tires. And I can see Brad in there like 
uh, Doug, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, like, hi, yeah, it's new, yeah, it's a Jeep Wrangler. Like, he's just going through, he's trying to be polite. Uh, there's just kind of an aggressive tone to everything. So I'm walking inside, I'm like, man, do I, I, you know, I'm at the porch, and I'm going, do I walk inside? Do I stay outside and just say, hey, bye, like it's a date. We're like, hey, had a good time. We are not hanging out again, right? Uh, so, but, I mean, it's my guy, George. I'm like, okay, cool. So we walk inside, and, I mean, we open the door, and there are just kids everywhere. I mean, I would guess 20 kids or so, just kind of in diapers and various ages going around. And I'm like, hey, George, man, why are, there, why are there all these dudes outside and all these kids inside? Like, is this a family reunion? What's going on? He goes, oh, my aunt runs a business. And I was like, okay, cool. So this is like a like kind of a daycare thing at your house. Okay, cool. And so babies are in this room over here, hallway, big room here, big room here, staircase going up. I look over there, there's babies. I'm like, okay, I'm kind of... And George's like, hey, I want to show you my room. I'm like, okay, cool, let's go see that. And I look into this room, um, and there is a lady who is being intimate with another man. And an older man sitting in a chair next to them reading a newspaper as if this was normal, right? <laughs> and I went, oh, it was like one of those things, like if you ever did band and you do a counter march and you just turn around, I was like, okay, so there's this room, and I'm turning around, and I'm going this way now, Right? <laughs> And I realized, I'm like, George, what is this? And he was like, oh, well, it's a, it's a brothel. My aunt runs a brothel, and these are babies who are, in some case, products of the brothel and kind of this thing going on. And I'm like, George, there, when I asked you for directions, that was the time to kind of give me the heads up on this. And about this time, as I'm turning around, the older gentleman puts the newspaper down, and he stands up, and he goes, who is that guy? And I said, George, it's been very nice seeing you. And I... <laughs> right? The woman and the other guy on the couch kind of doing their thing see this. They get up. There's no clothes on. And they're like, what is going on here? And they start walking out following. Now I'm leading the most awkward parade ever <laughs> out of this house, right? And once I hit the porch, I've got babies and I've got this probably a pimp and then this aunt and then the gentleman and then the babies and they're following me. And I'm just like, here we go. Like, Onward towards the Jeep. I get outside there. All these people who are still on the porch, they're aware of what has happened now. And they start closing in on me. And I'm like, excuse me, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, just going to the Jeep. Sorry about this. I get into the Jeep. I get the door open. I close it. Everyone's friendly. They're like, bye. And we kind of drive off. And Brad and I are driving, takes a left. He gets onto kind of the loop of the, our town. And we're just like this. <sighs> And finally, we kind of calm down and we look at each other and we're like, that was weird. <laughs> I just, I had this moment like, I cannot believe that that just happened to me in the year of our Lord 2000 in East Texas in my hometown. This has got to be the weirdest thing ever. But I also had this other thought going through my brain because I looked at Brad and he looked at me and we had this kind of conversation like, man, how do we get ourselves into this kind of situation? I felt legitimately scared for my life in that moment. And Brad tells me, I, I kind of felt legitimately scared for my life in that moment. We were a, in a place we probably shouldn't have been in a dangerous situation. And I was realizing I was a very foolish friend to Brad and bringing him along in that moment. And I was a very foolish person to myself. And all I could think is, man, I, I got to be a little bit smarter and wiser about the things that I do. This is a terrible moment. I got to get out of it. Does that sound like any of you guys? Now, maybe you're not in a brothel in East Texas during your high school years, okay? <laughs> but have you ever been in a moment with a person you're in a relationship with where you felt physically like you were in a bad situation and you were thinking, I got to get out of here? Or maybe emotionally you were with a person, you were like, this is so toxic, I, I got to get out of this thing. Or maybe spiritually you're with this group of religious people and the way they're talking to you, you're like, man, I know what they're saying is wrong, it sounds true, but I, I got to get out of this thing. The Bible says there are these two kinds of relationships in general that we can have, friends and fools, and today what I want us to talk about and really focus with crystal clarity on is how do I add more friends in my life? And how do I subtract more fools from my life? 
Now, before we jump into this, I want to just say this up front just as a disclaimer. I don't think it's ever going to be possible in this life to completely eliminate fools from your life and maximize friends in your life. Also, I just don't think that's healthy because I think ministry, if you're going to bear the, the cross of Christ on your life, you're going to be interacting with people uh, who are a little bit messy. And so let me just say this. I think in general, the goal of this kind of approach is going to be at as many people as you can in your friend zone. Maximize the number of friends in your life, especially those safest friends who are closest to you. And try to minimize the number of fools in your life, understanding we're always going to be around foolish and toxic people, and that's okay. What I want to guard against is the people who do one of two things. I only have friends in my life, and there are no fools. If I think you're a fool, I eliminate you, because those people typically tend to end up isolated and alone in a little clique over here. Or the people who go, I don't really care about pursuing safe relationships, and they only have toxic people in their lives, and they end up in a little isolated clique over here. We're going to be somewhere in between. But in general, if we could have more friends and less fools in our life, I think you're going to find your life to be that much better in Orlando in 2020. And so to jump in on that, I want to look at Proverbs chapter 13. So if you have that, you can Google search it. Maybe it's open in your Bibles, your swiped open, whatever your app, Google search. Or just take a picture on the screen. Here's what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, except for Jesus, says. Uh, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Sorry, I was looking for my water here. I guess it dropped. If someone finds my water over here, Nick or whatever, if you can bring it, that'd be super great. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm getting parched here. Let me read this again. Can I focus us again here after my water tirade? Okay, here we go. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. In the Bible, there are these two categories, friend and fool. And so I want to try to define, we've, we've talked about what a friend is, um, a, a wise person, a safe person. I want to try to thicken that out a little more so that we can see if this is what a friend is, the opposite of that is going to be this fool. And I think it's going to give us some clear categories. So here we go. Brandon, you bring me some water? Appreciate you, man. Thanks, buddy. Shout out to Brandon. Um, okay, so Jesus talks about this in the New Testament. He's talking to the disciples, and here's what he says. Hey, listen, if you ever move to a new town, guys, if you're following me, if you move to a new town, here's my recommendation for how to make friends, okay? And here's what he says. In Luke chapter 10, verse 3 through 7, he says, Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs, wise people, in the midst of wolves, foolish people. Carry no money bag, because the foolish people try to get it. No knapsack, which would have been like a lunchbox, right? Maybe a backpack with some clothes in it. Maybe a a carry-on item, uh, if you're going on a plane flight. No sandals, shoes only, closed-toed. No, that's not what that meant. Uh, And and greet no one on the road. Again, because these are foolish people who are there. This is me moving my way through the gentleman trying to get to the Jeep. Like, no, you know, don't, don't do that. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace or a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. What does he mean by this? Anybody grew up Catholic or anybody go to Catholic church? You have that moment where you share peace. You guys know what I'm talking about? You speak peace and they speak peace back. Well, this is a tradition of trying to train people in what, say, friendship is. Uh, We would do it today like this. Yo, what's up? Right? Like Jill. Yo, what's up, Jill? See, she just said, what's up back? I know that's a person of peace because I spoke to her. She listened to me and she spoke back. In Espanol, we'd say, que pasa? Como estan? Como estan? Bien? Bien? Good. Y tú? Bien. Oh, okay. Gracias. Right? See, how you doing? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing well. See, you're speaking peace back in Portuguese. Tudo bem. Oi, tudo bem? Oh, see, tudo bem. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Ciao, buddy. All right, see you later. Uh, I got to work on my Portuguese. Some of you are just like, that's not Portuguese. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so you get the point. I'm speaking something. They're speaking something back. There, there's a listening. There's a sharing that's going on there. Uh, if not, if they don't speak peace back, uh, back, it will return to you. And if that person does speak peace, basically, if you find this man of peace, this person of peace, remain in that same house, eating and drinking what they provide. They're going to serve you. They're going to be hospitable to you. That's a mark of someone who's a safe friend. For the laborer deserves his wages and do not go out from the house. Okay, boil it down to kind of three things here. We're going to do a lot of threes here. So if you're the note-taking type, it's about to be threes, Trinity. Uh, That's what we're going to do. So who are friends? There's three characteristics of friends, okay? They like you, they listen to you, and they serve you. Friends are people, safe people, wise people. These kind of people are the people who like you, they listen to you, and they serve you. They're hospitable towards you. They like you. 
When you're around them, they just generally like, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? Are you good? They seem interested in your life. When you talk, they don't just wait to talk. They're not just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. oh, I have, a, I have a story, right? They're not the one-up person at the table. Cool story, bro, but I've got one better for you. I was at the mall and I found this awesome dress and it was on sale and I saved a lot of money, right? They're legitimately listening to who you are and they're talking with you. And then finally, they serve you. If you're, if you're around this person, you're like, man, I'm, I'm thirsty. I'm gonna go get a coffee. No, wait, how about this? Why don't you stay here? I'll go get you a coffee. What do you want, Right? They, they serve you. They seek to be hospitable towards you. This is a wise person. The fool is the opposite of this, okay? And it's these three characteristics of the fool. They don't listen to you. In other words, they don't respect boundaries, okay? When you say, hey, uh, no, 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 that, that actually, no, I don't want that cup of coffee. They're like, hey, you'll like this coffee, right? You're like, oh, okay. Or if, you know, you're having a conversation and they walk up to you and you're like, hey, one minute. And then they just walk in a little bit more. You're like, oh, hold on for a second. I need to finish this phone call. And they just keep talking to you. You're trying to set boundaries with them and they're just not recognizing them or they're not respecting them. Uh, Charlie Murphy, who has now passed away, was Eddie Murphy's brother. He was on the show called The Chappelle Show. I'm not saying you should watch that show. YouTube, I'm not saying you should watch it. Don't, go, don't YouTube the, search this right now, okay? Okay, cool, that was a disclaimer. Uh, on this show, he, uh, he's telling a story about meeting Rick James for the first time, a musician. And um, he's describing Rick James, and Rick James was this person who didn't respect boundaries and party situations. And Charlie Murphy says, he, uh, he, he crossed the line habitually. He was a habitual line stepper, right? And this is someone who's a fool. They're a habitual line stepper. You set a boundary, they cross over it. You say, please don't do that. They do. When they come over your house, you're like, hey, can you take your shoes off? They're like, no. Nah. And they just, right? They just, they don't, they don't listen to you. That's a fool. Uh, number two, they don't like you. They like themselves. In other words, they're self-centered. Everything they do seems to be about them. Again, Uh, Most of their life, they're looking for ways to put themselves at the center of a story or in the center of the moment. They're just very self-centered. And finally, they don't serve you. They serve themselves. Or maybe we'll put it this way. They're just extra needy. You know someone who's just extra needy? Whenever you're around them, they just need a little more of your time. They need a little more of your food. They need a little more of your attention. They need a little more. It doesn't matter what you give to them. They just need a little more and a little more and a little more. Now, I'm not talking about children here, okay? If you guys become parents and your kids are like, uh, Mommy, hold me. And you're like, man, my arms are tired. You're just so needy. Man, you're a fool. I need kids of peace over here. So let's send this one back, right? That's not the thing to do here. I'm talking about grown people, like friends, peers who you're around. They're just needy because they don't serve you. They're constantly thinking about themselves. They're kind of narcissistic about things. These are toxic people. These are people who are foolish. And the Bible says a companion of fools, if you spend all your time only around fools, you're going to suffer much harm. You are going to be in the middle of a brothel in East Texas because you're a toxic person like I was to my friend Brad, okay? This is what it is. Now, I want you to do something. I want you to pull out. We're going to do interactive stuff here. I've just given you these two definitions. I want you to pull out your phones. We're going to take some notes. Open up a note-taking app or whatever. If you want to write this down, that's fine too. Maybe you want to just lower that brightness level. Because what I want you to do is I want you to make a list of some friends who come to mind. As I give you those three definitions of each, I want you to start to categorize the kinds of people in your life that you already know into one of these two categories. Again, if that person's sitting next to you, lower the brightness level. Maybe do the covering thing here. Hey, just tell everybody around you, be cool, be cool. Just be cool, respect boundaries, respect boundaries, okay? If someone is doing this and typing, it's not because you're that person, but if you keep moving their hand away, you're that person, right? (laughs) So I I just want you to just kind of start reminiscing in your mind as you're going through your friend list, who are the safe friends? Who are the, the, the friends, the wise friends? And who are the foolish friends or the toxic people? And I'm gonna give you some extra definitions here. Just, and we're going to do a little chart here, and we're just going to see what you write down. No one's going to have to admit this later. No one's going to look at this. I want to get you to start thinking with me about who these kinds of people are because it's an important step in this. So, so just here we go. A friend is someone who celebrates wins in your life. They like you. They listen to you. They serve you. When you get that promotion at work, they're like, that is fantastic, Right? When you get an A on that test, they're like, man, I'm so thrilled for you. When you get that sale at that business you were working at, you're like, man, that's so incredible. Everything that happens that's positive, they're there for you. you. Go, Man, I'm getting baptized. I'm making this big kind of 
spiritual decision. They're like, man, I can't wait to be there. They're celebrating the wins. That's what a friend does. A fool is jealous of your wins. You get that promotion, and they're like, well, it's not that good of a promotion. Right? You're like, oh, oh. Right? You, uh, you know, you make that sale. They're like, well, I guess that's okay. But, I mean, just the minimum salespeople make that sale. Right? <laughs> you, uh, you make a spiritual decision. I'm getting baptized. They don't go, oh, congratulations. They're like, well, finally, what took you so long? Right? They just seem to be so jealous of everything that's going on in your life. Okay. Uh, a friend keeps secrets. He's like, hey, can I trust you with this? And they're like, locked. Fort Knox. No one's getting in here. Even if they have a gun. Nope. It's just staying here. A fool shares secrets. They're the people who share secrets, maybe about not, not your secrets, but other people. Hey, I shouldn't be telling you this, right? I shouldn't be telling you this, but I'm going to go ahead. I can trust you, right? And you just immediately learn this person doesn't respect boundaries. Uh, a friend tries to like my other friends. Hey, can I introduce you to this? O- hey, friend, can I introduce you to this other group of friends? This friend, a safe friend, is going to be like, cool, nice to meet you. Let me, let me hear about you. What are your interests? And you, th- that friend can easily join your friend group. A fool is jealous of your other friends, Okay. When they meet them, they're like, on the way home from meeting them at the mall, they're like, well, they weren't that cool. I don't know what you see in them, right? I mean, they just get real, maybe they get real quiet, passive aggressive, and they're just like, because for them, they're thinking, if you have those friends and I can't be your friend anymore, they are so self-centered, they are thinking about themselves, they're not even considering that that might be something really good for you. Okay, I'll keep going. A friend is respectful of my opinions. Hey, I don't really like that political candidate, but hey, I understand how you would given your story, and we can agree to disagree, but I love you. You're my dog. We'll get through this. A fool tries to win an argument. Oh, you like that candidate? Well, let me tell you why my candidate is better than your candidate. Oh, you like, I can't believe you would like that candidate. Oh, you really like that movie? That movie's the worst. Oh, you like that album? That band is the worst, right? They're just constantly on that about you. Okay. A friend respects me. A fool gets angry with me. A friend respects my time. A fool gets annoyed at not spending enough time with me. It's like, hey, man, I really love this four-day weekend we just spent together. Man, it was awesome. We were in the hill country. We were just enjoying this. And like, man, I could just just spend more time with you. Okay, well, you want to try to do something maybe in the next month? Can we do something tomorrow? Tomorrow might be a little soon. Well, how about tonight? Tonight is even sooner than tomorrow. (laughs) And I need to get you a calendar to learn time. Like, I, I love you. What resources do I need to help you understand this boundary I'm setting right here? Right? Okay. Uh, a friend is generally aware of things. They seem to have awareness. A fool is unaware of things. They just seem to be generally unaware of the world, what's going on around them. And it's very simple to understand why people become foolish. It's because they are so insecure and self-centered, worried about other things. They're so insecure in the gospel, this idea that Jesus loves them unconditionally and they are free to mess up or not mess up and Jesus is still gonna love them anyway. They're so insecure about that that they're worried that if they don't have you as their friend, that they're somehow just going to explode inside. And so they hang on and they get clingy and they're just, the Bible says this is a fool. And a companion of fools is going to suffer much harm. Okay, so you guys, I think, probably have a list right now. You can close your phones to kind of protect, you know, the innocent there. (laughs) Put those away. I want you to be thinking about those. But here's here's the thing. Now with these three things clear, I want to do two more things left in here. I want to talk to you about how to add more friends and how to subtract more fools from your life. Okay, And then I want to give you three more just pieces of wisdom based on my life of being a toxic friend and a friendship that helped me to become a a much, much better friend. Okay, that's good? The remainder of our time? Okay. So here's how to add more uh, safe friends, more more friends to your life. Number one, say yes. If you're someone who doesn't have a lot of safe friends, when you meet somebody and if they seem like they're a safe friend, if they like you, if they listen to you, if they serve you, and they say, hey, you want to go do something later? Even if you're an introvert, say yes. Even if you got a lot of things to do and you're worried about your sleep schedule, just in general, say yes. Go to more things. Be where they are. If they invite you to come visit their life group, if their missional community is having a dinner, if there's a serving project going on and someone just invites you, say yes. If they're all going to Ale House after the table, okay? And they say, hey, you want to come to Ale House with us? You go, yes, and go spend time with them. Number two, once you say yes, Reflect, reflect on who these people are, who stands out. Create a draft of the people who are in your life and begin to rank them. Like, and that's okay. Again, you don't publicize this. Don't get on Instagram like, here are my favorite friends. Okay, this is not my space. Come on. Uh, (laughs) You you get you just in your mind you go, okay, listen, this person stands out, and this person stands out, and this person stands out. 
just reflect. Again, I'm trying to have you guys do this now with your notes. Reflect. These people seem to be safe friends in my life. I need to spend more time with these people. This is the, the person who walks with the wise. I want to walk with these people, okay? And once you have your list, then reach out for a one-on-one. Hey, I, I loved hanging out with you at Ale House the other night. Can we go grab a one-on-one? Can we go grab coffee? I had such a good time. You want to continue this in a one-on-one setting, right? Now, let me just sh- show you this. This is also how dating works. <laughs> this is why dating is just an extension of friendship. You go to a group. You say yes. You meet people. You put them all in the friend zone, right? A couple of girls, you know, a couple of guys rise to the top. You make a list, a little draft board, people I would date in my friend group in this order for these reasons. Again, don't post this on Instagram. <laughs> Creeper. Uh, yeah, just don't do that. Okay, words you write come back to bite. Words in the air stay there. Okay, so just in your own mind. It's kind of, you can always say more louder later. Uh, You just make your list, and then the people who stand out at the top of the list, you go, hey, man, I really enjoyed spending time with you. Would you want to go grab coffee later? Okay? That's how dating starts from friendship. Okay? Getting rid, subtracting fools from your life, it's the reverse of this. You just reverse engineer. And watch how this works. Okay? Is that thunder? Is this thunder? Are you guys hearing this? Is it thunder? Is is someone hungry? I, I don't know what's going on in here. Okay. I just thought maybe I'm getting old and I'm like, I'm hearing things. It's just, okay, how to subtract fools. Number one, shut it down. They're on your list, shut it down. Okay? When they say, uh, you know, hey, we had this thing go, just, hey, man, I need to bow out of that. I'm really sorry. I just got to shut it down. Shut down things with them. You want to limit the activity, the times you're around them, okay? They want something one-on-one, like, no, I'm shutting all this down. So that's number one. Number two, reflect on why it is they are foolish people to you. What is it about them with specificity? Because at some point they're going to ask, why have we not spent more time together? And you need to have a good answer. Hey, I've observed this to be consistent in your life, and your consistency is inconsistent with the love of Christ. What you're consistent in is inconsistent with the love of Christ. It's inconsistent with the gospel. I've noticed a tendency for you to be needy and not respect boundaries. And I can't be around people who don't respect boundaries because that's not healthy. So you shut it down, you reflect, and you, you, you come up with a really good reasoning in that process. And then the more they reach out to say, hey, you want to hang out? You want to hang out? You say no. This is the most important empowering phrase you can say as a human being. I want you to practice saying it with me. It's, it goes like this, no, okay? In Portuguese, it's no. In Spanish? Okay, hold on, wait. In French Haitian? Cool, I didn't know that. I was just guessing. Okay, cool. So let's say this together. Ready? No. No, you say no. Now let me tell you about this, just kind of how I, I observe this to work in my own life. Let me, this is telling you, let me show you. So the best friendship I've ever cultivated in my entire life is actually not with my best friend, Brad, although we have a great friendship. The best friendship I've been able to cultivate in my life is with my wife, Natalie. It's true. I've been married 15 years. We dated for a year and a half. We were engaged for a year. I mean, I've I've been with her since like the Bush administration, okay? (laughs) Like it's crazy. Uh... Yeah, so let me tell you how we just started dating. Some of you guys know our story, some of you don't. And again, at the very end of this series on week six, the very last week of February, Natalie is going to be here and we're going to do an AMA. You can just ask us anything about love, sex, dating, friendship, romance, kids, all that stuff. Um, And we'll tell most of it. There's some things we'll keep private because boundaries. You guys are weird. Don't ask those questions. Uh, No, I really do want you guys to ask whatever questions you want, and we'll try to just lovingly answer those questions. But Natalie and I met uh, our sophomore year of college. We were students at Baylor University in Waco, Texas, uh, home of the number one ranked uh, men's basketball team in America right now. Thank you very much. Top four volleyball team, top 10 football team, top uh, two uh, women's basketball team. No big deal. Uh, and um, at that time, they were not very good in any of those sports. But uh, so we had a lot of free time on the weekends. And um, the way I knew how to date up to that point was to just make out with girls. I, I started with romance. Someone, did someone just say, yeah? <laughs> someone was like, mm-hmm. I like your style, kid. Uh, <laughs> totally cool. Uh, <laughs> um, because that's kind of what I saw. You know, my dad just kind of slept around with everybody, uh, you know, cheated on my mom, just was with lots of different women. When he had his bachelor pad after they got a divorce, it was 
interesting. Uh, it was not unlike my friend George's house. Uh, and so I, that's what I was around all my life. That was what was normal. And so anytime I saw a girl, if I just thought she was a cool friend, I just started making out with her as quickly as I could. And so with Natalie and I, we started off, I was kind of trying to do all the right things. But I, again, my game plan for Christian dating was like uh, two plays long. It was like, okay, have a DTR and set up some physical boundaries and then get accountability from my life group. The end, right? <laughs> Everything else was fair game. And so very quickly after we started dating, I mean, we're making out and we're kissing and, you know, it's just, you know, getting handsy and all this other stuff. You guys, I mean, some of you know the deal about how that all goes. And after dating for a month over spring break, our sophomore year, she broke up with me. And here, yeah, you didn't see that coming, did you? Yeah. And here's the reason why. Um, I am, uh, I reflect a lot and take notes on everybody I dated. Uh, and like if there were trinkets that were passed, notes that were passed in school. We used to pass notes in school. Did you guys know this? Do you like me? You'd open this up and you're like, do you like me? Check yes or no. And you're like, check yes. And you're like, oh. And then you, so every girl I dated, they gave me their school picture. They gave me notes. They gave me like homecoming moms and those kind of things. I would, I, I would take a shoebox and I would create a file of them. And I would keep detailed notes in my journal about them. Like, like again, nothing weird. Y'all are just like, wow, serial killer. Uh, <laughs> I hope Netflix makes a documentary about you one day. Um, so I just, you know, I'm, listen, I have a PhD, I'm a historian, I research, even back then I'm a researcher. I just, I was curious about how that works. So school picture, I could staple it to a piece of paper and I could take notes, birthday. I would review it to remember important things because this is how I thought relationships worked, right? And so I had all of these boxes for all these girls in a library in my closet. Listen. This is not the worst thing I've told you today. <laughs> Come on. Um, but with Natalie, I, it was the, the box, the file was still open and it was on my shelf, right? And her picture was taped to the shelf and there's the stuff there. And somehow I'd gotten a candle. So I'd set a candle there with a picture of her. Like my sports jackets are over here and my collared shirts are over here and my closet opened. There's a shelf, there's a picture of her with all the trinkets. And she came over one day and she was like, is this your closet? I was like, sure. She was like, okay, let me see. And she opened it and so I was like, is that a shrine to me? <laughs> but she didn't say anything. She's an Enneagram one. So she was like, this would be inappropriate to call him a psychopath right here. So she was just like, she was weird on that date, and then, like, she broke up with me. And here's what she said to me. Here's what she said. She said, Doug, I, I think you're more into me than I'm into you. In other words, I, I think you're pursuing romance, and I'm just a flavor of the month for you. Dude, Natalie has game, okay? <laughs> she does not suffer fools. That's one of my favorite things about her. Anyway, I was heartbroken because I really liked her. In fact, I was pretty certain I was going to marry her, okay? And so I was just, you know, I'm going home like, Lord, what is going on? We were broken up for about a week, maybe a little longer than a week, and I'm just praying. I'm talking to my guys. I'm like, man, I don't know what's going wrong. And so we finally get back together after spring break, and we go to this park in our town, and we sit down across this bench, and I go, why do we break up? Like, help me understand. And she said, Doug, you're kind of a toxic person. You don't like me. You just like making out with me. And you don't listen to me, you just wait for me to stop talking so you can talk about your thing. And you don't serve me, you just serve yourself. And I was like, ooh, real talk, real talk. Uh. And so I left that, I said, hey, would you listen? Listen, I'm, I wanna receive this, I wanna be teachable. Would you consider trying to start this up again if we could do this the right way? And she said, okay, I'll pray about it. And so the next like, 48 to 72, 72 hours of my life was really tough. I like, couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. Like, just, I was like, oh my gosh, I want to be with this girl. And I've done this wrong and I've messed this up. And I'm such a toxic person. But I'm hearing this and I'm trying to respect the boundaries and I'm trying to understand. And so by God's grace, about 72 hours later, we got back together and she said, okay, I'm willing to pursue dating with you. And I said, okay, I'm willing to pursue dating with you. But we got to do things differently, right? Um, we, we've got to set up some better boundaries. I need to become a different kind of person because I don't know the kind of person you need. I don't know the kind of person I need to be if I'm gonna be a husband one day. And so I had to adjust that. And from that point on in March of 2002, uh, 
all the way through about until the time we got engaged, we practiced friendship. And yes, we still kissed. And yes, we still held hands. And yes, we still told each other we love. I mean, we finally got to a point by May of that year that I told her I loved her. She told me you love me back. We had the moment, <laughs> right? We, we did all of that stuff. But the basis of our relationship was friendship. Natalie taught me how to be a good friend and not a fool anymore. And we had gotten to this point in our relationship where everything was just very consistent and ordinary and normal. And so that next March, as I'm getting ready to propose to her, I did the only thing I could do in that moment. I broke up with her. <laughs> and let me tell you why. Because it was so consistent, the highs and the lows. It wasn't a roller coaster anymore. It was just the people mover at Disney, right? It was just super consistent. And I was worried because I only knew the highs and the lows and all this stuff. It was so consistent. It was boring. And Natalie was boring. And our relationship was boring. And I was like, man, I don't know. I thought marriage is supposed to be like just all this romance all the time. And I'm, I'm not sure if I feel that all the time. It just feels kind of normal and kind of ordinary. So I broke up with her. And that was the worst decision of my life, right? <laughs> and so she was like, why? I don't know. The, here, hold, can I make it worse? We were both leading a mission trip at the time I broke up with her in Mexico, um, where she was leading a team of college students and I was leading a team of college students. Not the best time to break up with your girlfriend. Let me just, let me just tell the guys, if you're thinking of breaking up with your girlfriend while leading a, a trip together to Mexico, uh, don't do that, okay? <laughs> You can always say more louder later, okay? Just get through the trip. So I broke up with her, and then the next two days was just miserable, and I was miserable, and I couldn't figure it out. I didn't know what was going on, and she was miserable, and she was crying. I thought we were going to get married. I was like, I don't know. Is, I feel so confused. So I go to my college pastor at the time, and I'm like, man, I don't know what's going on. I said, the thing I miss, I mean, I like this friendship thing with Natalie a lot. It's very consistent, but what I miss are the highs and the lows of dating, where it's romance and then you fight and then it's more romance and that's a terrible fight and then you make up kiss and then you fight again. I just, I missed all of that and I love the game and the chase of the girl and all of this stuff and my college pastor looked at me with the best advice he's ever given me in his life. He said, Doug, I promise you when you get married, there are better games ahead. And I was like, really? He said, yes. <laughs> you are settling for this mud puddle of a relationship over here when you could have this holiday at the beach. And so I want to encourage you to keep pursuing friendship with her and you add engagement to it and you get married. And I promise you, you will have a grand new adventure. It'll be way better than what you're experiencing in this toxic relationship you're having. And he was right. And so I went to Natalie and said, I apologize. Will you forgive me? Let's get back together. And she said yes because she loved me and I loved her. And two months later, I proposed to her. <laughs> and she said yes, obviously. Uh, and then a year later, we got married and it's been 15 years. And let me just tell you something. Most days in our relationship, it's not a lot of romance. And in most days of our relationship, it's not a lot of dating. And in most days in our relationship, it's not a lot of sex. We have a lot of sex. But it's not all sex, okay? <laughs> most days of our relationship, you know what it is? Friendship. It's friendship. I wake up in the morning. I go, how'd you sleep? And she goes, I slept well. How'd you sleep? Great. Can I cook you breakfast? Yeah. Can I make you tea? Yeah. Okay, cool. And I go cook her breakfast. And I make tea. And she'll typically go in and drink a cup of tea, but she also likes to do the little latte machine because she's... Fancy. And so I go, hey, can I help the kids get ready for school? Yeah, okay, so we do this. Can I take Grace with me? Okay, yeah. I text her during the day. Hey, you need anything? I'm coming home, right? It's, if you just looked at the, the balance of our dialogue, it's just, it would be like just the script of these two friends who just love each other with a deep love because that's what our marriage is. It's a friendship that we add romance and dating and sexuality to, but it's a friendship. And Natalie had to teach me how to be a good friend and to stop being a fool. And so here's what I want to say. In God's mercy and grace, if you're someone who's here today and you've been taking notes and you're realizing that the fool doesn't describe your friends, the fool describes you, I want you to know that by God's grace and in his power, and he is infinitely powerful, that he can stand with you in the fire of your life and he can move you from being a foolish friend to a wise friend. He can do that here today. And we have this thing here called missional communities. 
And part of the reason we open them up to everybody and we talk about the connection lines is we want to get you guys involved in that because you're going to find some safe friends who will love you enough to help you grow out of where you are. One of the things we say here is you are welcome to come as you are, but you can't stay as you are because God has something better for you and he doesn't want you to grow up to be a spoiled brat, okay? He wants you to grow up to be someone who models the love of Christ to everyone you know. Have you thought about Jesus uh, in all of this? Did you know that Jesus is the greatest model of friendship you could ever see? Just, I'm gonna read some verses here uh, uh, in, a, in a little bit. Uh, I wanna read this. I've got some other thoughts I wanna say, but I just wanna read this just to kind of close all this stuff out. Jesus loved the world. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For that son, Jesus, did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through himself. He loves us. He doesn't just like us, he loves us. When Bartimaeus, who was blind in the New Testament, is walking around, he starts calling out to Jesus. And Jesus is a famous rabbi and teacher. And so he just kind of, you know, you'd think, I'm a famous rabbi and teacher. I'm just going to walk on past this little dude over here, right? You didn't buy buy a ticket to this show, right? So you, you would think someone of his stature might do that. And Jesus listened to him, and he stopped, and he looked at Bartimaeus. And he called him. And the blind man came in saying, take my, uh, uh, came saying to him, take heart. And Jesus said, get up. Um, his friend said, get up. He is calling you. Jesus looked at Bartimaeus and said, I'm listening to you. I don't only just love you, but I'm listening to you. When people pray, when people talk to Jesus, he listened to them. He loves us. He listens to us. And then Jesus said this of himself in Matthew 20. The son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The acid test of this thing we're talking about called friendship. If you, if you don't remember anything else, just remember this. Hey, if you'll love like Jesus, you'll be the best, most healthy, wisest friend you can be. If you'll like peace, people and you'll listen to people and you'll serve other people, you will be the kind of friend that your friends want to be friends with. Now, on that note, as the band gets up here and gets ready to do a response time, I want to talk about kind of just three other thoughts. This is just to kind of attack on at the very end of here. Three other thoughts on fools and friendships that I want to equip you guys with as you're going to go. And maybe you want to take screenshots of this. This is kind of the practical note-taking section here. Because some of you are thinking right now, i got to go have hard conversations with these people. I don't know how to do this. It's going to be awkward. Some of us don't like conflict. Some of us don't like this stuff. So let me just kind of encourage you with some truth here. Number one, foolishness is dramatic and drama is entertaining. But consistency may seem boring, but boring breeds momentum. What we love in our friendships and our relationships is the drama. We like the roller coaster. But I, I've come to believe that the, the, the friendship and the love of Jesus, it's again, it's a lot like the people mover at Disney. It just kind of one speed, no thrills, just kind of gets you where you need to go. But something about that just breeds consistency. Tell you what, I never feel unsafe when I ride the people mover. I always feel unsafe when I ride rock and roller coaster. Always. <laughs> Especially that first, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, it's a really, like, really fast thrill coaster at Disney, and it just, like, takes off, and you're just like, ah! You know, the ups and the downs, and the, it's in the dark. And, you know, my daughter is like, this is amazing. She's seven, and I'm like, ah! Right? The photo is always her going, yeah! And me going, like, I'm going to die. Right? Uh, that's how we pursue relationships oftentimes, right? And culture tells us, go for the flash, go for the romance. Listen. It's consistency that breeds momentum, and consistency sometimes feels boring, but boring will help you breed momentum. So go after the boring. Number two, a friend is what is planned. A fool is what is permitted. If you're going to find friendship, you've got to have a plan. You've got to go after it. You have to say no. You have to set boundaries. If you want to be surrounded by a companion of fools, just permit everything. Just go, okay, yeah, just say yes to everything, and I think you'll end up with a lot of fools. So let's get out of the habit of being just permissive people. It's okay for you to set a plan and to say no and to be strategic about that. And finally, this is, this is maybe the one that will challenge us most, I think. Conflict is a choice. You can have awkward on the outside or anxious on the inside, but it's your choice. You have that one friend and you're not sure, that one guy you're dating you gotta break up with, that one girl you're dating you gotta break up with, that friend you gotta kinda start to set some boundaries on. You might think, oh, cause I gotta have conflict. Once you realize that conflict is there, which you should because y'all are all smart and when you're aware, you're aware of the conflict. I mean, most of us are aware, we're smart. We know there's conflict there. You have two choices at that point. It's either gonna be awkward on the outside in this conversation or you're gonna be anxious on the inside. See, if you don't 
enter into conflict and set a boundary, that person may like you and you may be permitting them to be in your life, but you know this, you're gonna be on the inside nervous. It's gonna be hard to sleep. You're gonna keep asking yourself that question. Why am I doing this? Oh my gosh, this is so tough. So you can have anxiety on the inside or you can have awkwardness on the outside. But if you choose awkwardness on the outside, guess what? No anxiety on the inside. And so when it comes to conflict, you gotta pick your poison. I wish there was a world where there was no conflict, but the problem is we live in the fall. People's relationships don't work like they're supposed to. And so what Jesus does is he calls us to be bold and to love like him. Jesus set boundaries. Jesus said no. Crowds came after him and said, Jesus, come teach us. He said, no, I gotta go to the other side. Jesus said no. It's really okay for you to say no. Jesus was the greatest friend any of us had. If you wanna know how to be a good friend, be like Jesus. If you wanna be confident, think upon Jesus. And so here's what I want us to do. I want us to reflect on this. Lucas and Jay are gonna sing a song for us called What a Friend. And I want you just to just listen to the words or look at the words and just maybe spend some time praying wherever you are, maybe asking Jesus to, to teach you and to empower you to be the kind of bold, proactive friend you need to be to gather everybody you can into your friend zone and just see what he might do.